The Years is a 1937 novel by Virginia Woolf, the last she published in her lifetime. It traces the history of the Pargeiter family from the 1880s to the present day of the mid-1930s. Although spanning 50 years, the novel is not epic in scope, focusing instead on the small private details of the characters' lives. Except for the first, each section takes place on a single day of its titular year, and each year is defined by a particular moment in the cycle of seasons. At the beginning of each section, and sometimes as a transition within sections, Wolfe describes the changing weather all over Britain, taking in both London and countryside as if in a bird's eye view before focusing in on her characters. Although these descriptions move across the whole of England in single paragraphs, Wolfe only rarely and briefly broadens her view to the world outside Britain. The years begins in 1880, in early spring in London. Eleanor Pargeiter is in her early 20s. She comes from a large family whom she takes care of. Her mother is terminally ill and her father, the colonel, is a war veteran who is secretly having an affair that keeps him out of the house most of the time. That leaves Eleanor in charge of his siblings, Delia, Edward, Martin, Millie, Morris, and Rose. Everyone in the house is on the edge because of their mother. She might die soon and some siblings are prepared while others aren't. Mrs. Pargeiter dies that night surrounded by his children who bid her farewell, except for Delia. She is unable to grieve in the same way as her siblings. Delia has been feeling trapped by her mother's illness, and she's overtly anticipating her mother's death. When she finally dies, she feels free. At the funeral, Delia's mind is wandering to avoid dealing with her loss. It's 1891, Autumn. Kitty, cousin to the Pargeiters has married Lord Laswade. They have a child, Millie is married to Gibbs, Edward's friend. In London, Eleanor who is in her early thirties is still in charge of the household. She works for a charity that offers cheap housing for the homeless. Martin who is 23 is on an adventure in India. Morris is now a lawyer, married to Celia. It's 1908, during the summer when Martin now in his 40s comes home. He goes to see Eleanor who is now in her 50s. The colonel has lost his brother and his wife. He is not in great health, having suffered a stroke in recent years. Eleanor and his father, the colonel have grown closer. She dedicates most of her time to him. Rose who is in her 40s and still unmarried also arrives at Eleanor's place. She's here to visit her cousin Sarah and Maggie. They decline to meet her. It is said that Delia finally got married. Kitty is also in town to watch the opera which seems to be missing the most important audience, King Edward VII. Later that night, screams of the death of King Edward VII fill the streets. The summer of 1911 finds Eleanor in Spain. It is unknown how long she's been there. She breaks the news of her father's death. Eleanor goes to see Morris and Celia. She is a bit envious of her brother's life. They now have three children. Eleanor tells Celia that Maggie is married in France, and she's expecting. It is revealed that Rose has been arrested. The winter of 1913 unfolds as we meet Eleanor once again in her late 50s. She is finally selling the home in which she grew up in with her siblings. Martin remains unmarried in his mid-40s. It is revealed Martin found out about his father's affair and becomes conflicted about it. Rose is released from prison and awarded a medal for serving in the army for her country. She becomes an activist fighting injustice. Eleanor is having dinner with Maggie and her husband in the winter of 1917 in London. The war has forced them to move back from France. There is a bombing raid that night which forces them to take refuge in the cellar. It's 1918, during the summer, Eleanor, now 62 years old. She has been to India and other places since piquing an interest in traveling. She is barely around anymore. Delia, who has been missing in action for a while throws a party for her family. Delia has been married for a long time now in her 60s. Eleanor now in her 70s is still single. She has an existential crisis about how she's lived at the party. She questions her purpose and meaning in her life. Everyone is in attendance as they drive around memory lane. Edward is seen for the first time since the 1880s. The party goes on till dawn as the Pargeiter family winds down and looking back to a life that was chaotic yet so beautiful. In the morning, they leave, each one following their separate paths. 1880. It was an uncertain spring. Colonel Abel Pargeiter visits his mistress Mira in a dingy suburb, then returns home to his children and his invalid wife Rose. His eldest daughter Eleanor is a do-gooder in her early twenties, and Millie and Delia are in their teens. Morris, the eldest brother, is already a practicing barrister. Delia feels trapped by her mother's illness and looks forward to her death. 
10-year-old Rose quarrels with 12-year-old Martin and sneaks off by herself to a nearby toy shop. On the way back she is frightened by a man exposing himself. As the family prepares for bed, Mrs. Pargeiter seems at last to have died, but she recovers. At Oxford it is a rainy night and undergraduate Edward, the last Pargeiter sibling, reads Antigone and thinks of his cousin Kitty Malone, with whom he is in love. He is distracted by two friends, the athletic Gibbs and the bookish Ashley. Daughter of a head of house at Oxford, cousin Kitty endures her mother's academic dinner parties, studies half-heartedly with an impoverished female scholar named Lucy Craddock, and considers various marriage prospects, dismissing Edward. She is sitting with her mother when the news is brought that Mrs. Pargeiter is dead. At Mrs. Pargeiter's funeral Delia distracts herself with romantic fantasies of Charles Stuart Parnell and struggles to feel any real emotional response to her mother's death. 1891. An autumn wind blew over England. Kitty has married the wealthy Lord Lasswade, as her mother predicted, and Millie has married Edward's friend Gibbs. They are at a hunting party at the Lasswade estate. Back in London, Eleanor, now in her thirties, runs her father's household and does charity work to provide improved housing for the poor. Traveling to London on a horse-drawn omnibus she visits her charity cases, reads a letter from Martin 23 and having adventures in India and visits court to watch Morris argue a case. Morris is married to Celia. Back in the street, Eleanor reads the news of Parnell's death and tries to visit Delia, living alone and still an avid supporter of the Irish politician, but Delia is not at home. Colonel Pargeiter visits the family of his younger brother, Sir Digby Pargeiter. Digby is married to the flamboyant Eugenie and has two little daughters, Maggie and Sarah called Sally. 1907. It was midsummer, and the nights were hot. Digby and Eugenie bring Maggie home from a dance where she spoke with Martin, who has returned from Africa. At home, Sarah lies in bed reading Edward's translation of Antigone and listening to another dance down the street. Sarah and Maggie are now in their mid-twenties. Maggie arrives home, and the girls tease their mother about her romantic past. 1908. It was March and the wind was blowing. Martin, now 40, visits the house of Digby and Eugenie, which has already been sold after their sudden deaths. He goes to see Eleanor, now in her fifties. Rose, pushing 40 and an unmarried eccentric, also drops in. 1910. An English spring day, bright enough, but a purple cloud behind the hill might mean rain. Rose, 40, visits her cousins Maggie and Sarah, or Sally who are living together in a cheap apartment. Rose takes Sarah to one of Eleanor's philanthropic meetings. Martin also comes, and so does their glamorous cousin Kitty Lasswade, now nearing 50. After the meeting Kitty visits the opera. That evening at dinner Maggie and Sarah hear the cry go up that King Edward VII is dead. 1911. The sun was rising, very slowly it came up over the horizon shaking out light. The chapter begins with a brief glimpse of the south of France, where Maggie has married a Frenchman named René, or Rennie, and is already expecting a baby. In England Colonel Pargeiter has died and the family's old house is shut up for sale. Eleanor visits her brother Morris and Celia, who have a teenage son and daughter named North and Peggy, another son, Charles, is mentioned in a later section. Also visiting is Sir William Watney, one of spinster Eleanor's few youthful flirtations. There is gossip that Rose has been arrested for throwing a brick, this was a time of suffragette protests. 1913. It was January, snow was falling, snow had fallen all day. The Pargeiter's family home is being sold and Eleanor says goodbye to the housekeeper, Crosby, who must now take a room in a boarding house after 40 years in the Pargeiter's basement. From her new lodgings Crosby takes the train across London to collect the laundry of Martin, now 45 and still a bachelor. 1914. It was a brilliant spring day, the day was radiant. The time is one month before the outbreak of the First World War, although no hint is given of this. Wandering past St. Paul's Cathedral, Martin runs into his cousin Sarah, or Sally, now in her early 30s. They have lunch together at a chop shop then walk through Hyde Park and meet Maggie with her baby. Martin mentions that his sister Rose is in prison. Martin continues, alone, to a party being given by Lady Lasswade, cousin Kitty. At the party he meets teenage Anne Hillier and Professor Tony Ashton, who attended Mrs. Malone's dinner party in 1880 as an undergraduate. 
The party over, Kitty changes for a night train ride to her husband's country estate, then is driven by motor car to his castle. She walks through the grounds as day breaks. 1917. A very cold winter's night, so silent that the air seemed frozen. During the war Eleanor visits Maggie and Rennie, who have fled France for London. She meets their openly gay friend Nicholas, a Polish-American. Sarah arrives late, angry over a quarrel with North, who is about to leave for the front lines and whose military service Sarah views with contempt. There is a bombing raid, and the party takes its supper to a basement room for safety. 1918. A veil of mist covered the November sky. The briefest of the sections, at little more than three pages in most editions of the novel, 1918, shows us Crosby, now very old and with pain in her legs. She hobbles home from work with her new employers, whom she considers, dirty foreigners, not, gentlefolk, like the Pargiders. Suddenly guns and sirens go off, but it is not the war, it is the news that the war has ended. Present day. It was a summer evening, the sun was setting. Morris's son North who is in his 30s, has returned from Africa, where he ran an isolated ranch in the years after the war. He visits Sarah, in her 50s and living alone in a cheap boarding house, and they recall the friendship they carried on for years by mail. North's sister Peggy, a doctor in her late 30s, visits Eleanor, who is over 70. Eleanor is an avid traveler, excited and curious about the modern age, but the bitter, misanthropic Peggy prefers romantic stories of her aunt's Victorian past. The two pass the memorial to Edith Cavell in Trafalgar Square and Peggy's brother Charles, who died in the war, is mentioned for the first and only time. Delia, now in her 60s, married an Irishman long ago and moved away, but she is visiting London and gives a party for her family. All the surviving characters gather for the reunion. Greater freedom in sexual matters. Briefly introduces a suffragette character, Nora Graham. Third chapter similar to Edward's Oxford scene in the finished novel. In a deleted passage, Edward imagines Antigone and Kitty fused into a single glamorous figure and struggles with the urge to masturbate, writing a poem in Greek to calm down. Edward's friend Ashley is called, Jasper Jevons, in this version. Fourth essay describes the centuries-long tradition of all-male education at Oxford and its influence on Edward's sexual life, contrasted with the limited education available to women. Here Ashley Jevons is called, Tony Ashton, and once in the following chapter Tony Ashton is called, Tony Ashley, suggesting that these various names originally referred to a single character in Wolf's mind. It is specified that Edward and Kitty's mothers are cousins, a relationship left unstated in the novel. Fourth chapter similar to Kitty's introductory scenes in the novel. There is more detail on her dislike for and sympathy with Tony Ashton's effeminacy. It's revealed that Kitty's mother comes of Yorkshire farming stock, and Kitty recalls with pleasure being kissed under a haystack by a farmer's son. Fifth essay more detail on Kitty's awkward closeness with her teacher Lucy Craddock, Miss Craddock's own frustrated academic hopes, and the reaction of male academics to intellectual women. Miss Craddock has another less pretty and more studious pupil named Nellie Hughes, of the family who in the novel are called, the Robsons. Fifth chapter similar to the scene of Kitty's visit to the Robsons here changed from the Hughes to the Brooks, who are determined that Nellie will succeed academically. Kitty enjoys sharing Yorkshire roots with the mother, and more detail is given on her attraction to the son of the family. The chapter ends with Kitty determined to leave Oxford and become a farmer's wife. Sixth essay discusses the genteel feminine ideal to which Kitty and her mother must aspire, and contrasts it with the sincere respect for women of the working class Mr. Brook, ends in praise of Joseph Wright, a real-life scholar whose collaboration with his wife Wolf admired. The novel had its inception in a lecture Wolf gave to the National Society for Women's Service on January 21, 1931, an edited version of which would later be published as Professions for Women. One, having recently published A Room of One's Own, Wolf thought of making this lecture the basis of a new book-length essay on women this time taking a broader view of their economic and social life, rather than focusing on women as artists, as the first book had. As she was working on correcting the proofs of the waves and beginning the essays for the common reader, second series, the idea for this essay took shape in a diary entry for the 16th of February 1932, and I'm quivering and itching to write my, what's it to be called, men are like that, no that's too patently feminist, the sequel then, for which I have collected enough powder to blow up St. Paul's. 
It is to have four pictures, capitalization and punctuation is in manuscript. Two, the reference to four pictures in this diary entry shows the early connection between the years and three guineas, which would, indeed, include photographs. Three, on the 11th of October 1932, she titled the manuscript, the P-A-R-G-I-T-E-R-S, an essay based upon a paper read to the London National Society for Women's Service, capitalization is in manuscript. 4-5 During this time, the idea of mixing the essay with fiction occurred to her, and in a diary entry of the 2nd of November 1932, she conceived the idea of a novel essay, in which each essay would be followed by a novelistic passage presented as extracts from an imaginary longer novel, which would exemplify the ideas explored in the essay. 6 Wolf began to collect materials about women's education and lives since the later decades of the 19th century, which she copied into her reading notebooks or pasted into scrapbooks, hoping to incorporate them into the essay portions of the Parguiders they would ultimately be used for three guineas. Between October and December 1932 Wolf wrote six essays and their accompanying fictional extracts for the Parguiders. By February 1933, however, she jettisoned the theoretical framework of her novel essay, and began to rework the book solely as a fictional narrative, although Anna Snaith argued in her introduction to the Cambridge edition of the novel that her decision to cut the essays was not a rejection of the project's basis in nonfiction, but affirmation of its centrality to the project and to her writing in general. Eight, some of the conceptual material presented in the Parguiders eventually made its way into her nonfiction essay letter, Three Guineas, 1938. In 1977 a transcription of the original draft of six essays and extracts, together with the lecture that first inspired them, was edited by Mitchell Liska and published under the title The Parguiders. Wolf's manuscripts of the years, including the draft from which The Parguiders was prepared, are in the Henry W. and Albert A. Berg collection of the New York Public Library.